Welcome back. All right, we are Mech 1320. We are in the second part of Chapter 3, so uh, we just kind of finished out the first part of Chapter 3 lecture. This is the second part of Chapter 3. We're going to talk about mechanical advantage, basic machines, torque, power, efficiency, and you guys can see the rest kind of here as we go through. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. All right, let's talk about mechanical advantage, okay? What is it by definition? It's the ratio of the force delivered to the load to the f actual force applied, all right? Mechanical advantage. So that's us using some sort of tool or something to help us, you know, move something, okay? Just think of it, uh, you know, as that, so, as simple as it can get. But it's the actual load divided by the actual force, okay? So let's take a look at an example here. We have a lever used to lift a, a mass A of 100 pounds by mass B, which is 20 pounds. What is the mechanical advantage if we do this? Okay, so mass A is 100 pounds, mass B is 20 pounds. Okay, and we're using mass B to lift mass A, right? We have this, we're using the, a lever type mechanical advantage. So weight A, that's the actual load we're trying to lift. Okay, and weight B is the force. Okay, so the mechanical advantage for us to use this, uh, you know, we're prying it up or something like that is 100 divided by 20, which is 5, okay? So we're using a lever-type scenario here on a fulcrum. And we're going to get into those because we're going to talk right now about the basic machines, all right? There's six different basic machines uh, that we use, okay? Just, you know, throughout life, not just in industry or things like that. So the first one is the lever. The second one is the wheel and the axle. The third is a pulley. The fourth is an inclined plane. The fifth is a wedge, and lastly, a screw, okay? So let's take a look at a picture of what each one of these looks like. All right, so we take a look at the lever, the wheel and axle, the pulley, the inclined plane, the wedge, the screw. And we can all think of, you know, real-life examples where these are going to come into play, all right? Pulleys, right? We're lifting something up. we got to pull weight up off the ground. Cranes are like an example of a pulley. You know, a wedge, we want to split wood or split something, drive it between. We use a wheel and axle, right? A wheelbarrow or a cart or, you know, we drive a truck, those different things like that. We have a lever, right? We want to get some leverage underneath something and pry it up. An inclined plane, right? Why do we use an inclined plane? You know, think about a wheelchair ramp or something like that where someone has to go up um, instead, they can't use the stairs, right? So they got to be go, able to go up on a sidewalk or things like that. So we have an advantage here. It's a simple machine being able to get something up an inclined plane. The Egyptians, when they built the pyramids, they used inclined planes, okay? And then we have a screw, all right? Something that we use, you know, to fasten things together as well. All right, so if we take a look at the lever a little bit more in depth here, we have three different classes of levers. We have a first class lever, a second class lever, and a third class lever. Well, the difference really with the levers is where the fulcrum is, okay? And the fulcrum is kind of our tilting point or where we kind of place it, whether it's in the middle or one edge or the other and that sort of scenario. So the little triangle here represents our fulcrum, okay? So that's kind of our balancing point. So when we have a first class lever, I want you to think of like, you know, a pry bar or something like that where we're trying to get a nail out of wood or something along those lines, okay? So we have a fulcrum, and based on where that is, all right, where we can place that, we have a resistance. That's the load we're trying to move. The effort is, you know, how far, how much work that you have to push down on, you know, to actually get yourself a mechanical advantage using this lever, okay? So, you know, good example, prying up a rock, all right? Or we're using a shovel, constantly doing that sort of thing. A second class lever, okay? is where the fulcrum is all the way at the end. So our effort, okay, to move the, full, the force or the load, all right, we pull up on it and dump it down, okay? And so that's kind of how, you know, we're looking at a wheelbarrow type scenario there. Even though a wheelbarrow has, a, you know, a wheel and an axle, it's still a, a fulcrum when we want to dump what's in the wheelbarrow, right? right? We stop the wheelbarrow and we lift it up and we dump, all right? So that's why. Even though it's a wheel and an axle, we can still use it a fulcrum, and that's where the point is, right? We lift up. That's our effort, all right, our force, you know, to dump what's inside. Okay, and then we have a third-class lever here, 
where we have the fulcrum still at one end, we have the resistance, and the effort force is in the middle. So you can see the difference between the second class lever and the third class lever. It's really where our effort force is, um, where that fulcrum sits and allows it to balance. So like old school like steam shovels or things like that. Even you using a dirt shovel, right? You put it in the ground, generally you move your arm up, you know, halfway through the shovel as you're carrying dirt or things like that. And where your other hand is, it's the fulcrum at the end of the shovel. So same kind of concept. We use it to carry weight or dirt or shovel or do those sort of things. All right, so there's kind of an example of the three different kinds of levers uh, and where the fulcrum is and how the effort uh, that we have to exert needs to be applied. Okay. Next, we have the pulley system. Okay. Pulley definitely gives us a huge mechanical advantage uh, to lift a lot more weight than we are normally capable of just by increasing the number of pulleys. So in this particular pulley system, it cuts the weight in half. So hence, W divided by 2. So as we combine more pulleys, we increase our mechanical advantage. The whole point to have mechanical advantage right, is so that we or whatever job we're doing, it takes less work to move whatever force we have to move, okay? And then comes into play like, you know, robots, overhead cranes, you know, those sort of things. So let's look at another example here. So what is the force that needs to be applied at the end of the rope to balance the weight? Okay, so the force at the end of the rope, so let's imagine that's us pulling down on the, the arrow piece, the red arrow right there. That's us pulling down because we're trying to lift something up right, and balance it, okay? So what that's going to be is it's the force is going to be half the weight because of the number of pulleys we have, half the weight. So how do we calculate that mechanical advantage? We're going to take a weight and divide it by 2. So in this case, okay, weight divided by 2. So our mechanical advantage when we do the algebra behind this is 2. It doesn't matter if we have a numerical value or not, okay? Because when we divide by a fraction, right, we multiply by the reciprocal. So that's why our mechanical advantage is 2, right? It cuts our workload in half. So if this was 100 pounds, right, 100 divided by 2 is 50, okay? So that's how much force we would have to pull down with is 50 pounds to lift 100 pounds, all right, because it gives us a mechanical advantage of 2, meaning we don't have to lift the full 100 pounds now. We only have to lift about 50 pounds worth of the weight to lift the 100 pounds. So that's kind of the whole point of why we have a mechanical advantage. Okay, so let's look at example three here. This is a block and tackle type system. Okay, block and tackle. Why is it a block and tackle? Because notice we still only show two pulleys there, but notice those pulleys have dividers. Okay, so we can still use more, it's still like using more than one pulley. So that's what you really got to pay attention to here. So it's a block and tackle system because there's multiple grooves on each side of the pulley, so we can, you know, it will aid us in our mechanical advantage. So now this one's going to change our mechanical advantage now. So essentially, even though we only show physically two pulleys, there's four parts to it, and you can look closely and see that the ropes are in different grooves. So... Let's say, you know, how much force do we have to pull up now, all right, with a block and tackle, and we've got four pulleys. So say our, we're trying to lift 100 pounds. Now that we have four pulleys, okay, it saves us even more. Our mechanical advantage is even greater. So it's W divided by 4 is what we have to pull down with. So imagine we're pulling on that rope where the red arrow is, all right, it's going to cut that total weight by 4. So if this is 100 pounds, the weight we're trying to lift is 100 pounds. You know, you and I could go over there and it, we'd each probably struggle to lift 100 pounds like straight off the ground really high, okay? But if we use a, a block and tackle or pulley type system, now I only have to exert myself for 25 pounds worth to, you, to lift the weight that is 100 pounds, okay? So our mechanical advantage now is four times, okay? Four times. So W divided by W over 4 is four times. So in order to lift this now, it's 100 divided by 4. So I really only have to exert 25 pounds worth of force, okay, to lift this up. So very important here when we got block and tackle. So 
the number of pulleys is what we divide by. So there's four pulleys. We're going to take our weight and divide it by four. Even though it's a block and tackle and it only looks like two pulleys, all right, essentially it's still doing the work of four pulleys. All right, let's talk about torque. Okay, anytime you hear the word torque, you should, take, you should think of something that's rotational. Torque, something rotational or a twisting effort around an axis, okay? Like a torque wrench. So, you know, you torque the lug nuts down on your car and things like that, okay? A torque has um, a magnitude and direction. It's a vector. Remember, we talked about that stuff before, all right? has a magnitude and a direction. So the direction for us is described as clockwise or counterclockwise. That's what CW means. CW is clockwise. CCW is counterclockwise. So we do that about a specific axis, the x-axis, the y-axis, or the z-axis. Okay, so its magnitude is going to be like in the x, y, or z plane. Okay, and its direction is going to be clockwise or counterclockwise as we talk about torque. So the simplest way for us to calculate torque is force times radius. The radius being, you know, if you are putting your lug nut on your tire or on your wheel, all right, to put your tires on. The radius is whatever the distance is from that lug nut and the length of your socket that you're putting on there or your socket wrench that you're putting on there, okay? So... Some common units of torque for us are a newton meter, a foot pound, or an inch pound when we do some calculations, okay? Let's take a look at power. Power is work over time. And here in the United States, right, we cue everything in terms of uh, horsepower. So these equations are all at the end of chapter three in your book, right before the problems, all right? But horsepower is equal to power times 1 over 33,000, okay? That's for us to do all the unit conversions there. So that's how we get horsepower. All right, you can read in the book where horsepower originally stemmed from, you know, a, a guy, I think it was back in Ireland, actually did a calculation where, you know, how, how much a horse could pull a certain distance in a certain amount of time. So that's kind of where it came from, right? Uh, work divided by time. It kind of became, you know, a force, distance, time kind of relationship. Now, he was slightly inaccurate what one horse could do, but, you know, that's kind of where it gave us the idea. I think he was originally at, like, 550 pounds or something along those lines. But you can read about that. It's in the chapter, okay? Power in foot-pounds, okay, is going to be torque times omega. Remember we talked about in the last lecture, omega is our, is our radians per second. Omega is how fast we are rotating around in a circle. So whenever you think of torque or radians, omega, you need to think of something that is in a circular type motion, okay? So torque, inch pounds, is going to be power times 63,025 divided by, by omega. You're going to have to use that on your homework uh, a couple times as well. So that'll be on your sheet. It's really just uh, substituting into these equations, guys, and, and getting out the correct value uh, in the right units it's asked for, okay? So shouldn't be too hard, but I just wanted to kind of review, uh, you know, what we're doing here. All your problems are going to give you a couple different things, and then you'll have to solve for the third thing. Notice, you know, in general, uh, there's three variables with most of this. You're going to get two and solve for the third uh, based on value. All right, percent efficiency, get used to this one. Um, we do this in electrical. We do this in mechanical you know, pretty much anything. We want to know how efficient a system is. So in this case, it's always output over input. I just, just remember, if, it's, if you can always remember, output over input times 100%, because efficiency is always in percentage. That output over input will give you a decimal, all right? Then we multiply by 100 so that we know what the percentage is. So power out over power in, or think of output over input. Same thing we did in electrical. All right, now some different classes of load. These are in your book on pages 74 through 78. So um, you can look at the different figures that they have there uh, for you guys to be able to relate these. I didn't want to copy and paste everything and, and do that sort of thing. But constant torque loads, okay? 
We're, remember, thinking of torque, circular speed. So the torque stays constant, and the speed is going to vary, okay? Or speed and torque are inverses of one another. So what you really need to get out of the mechanical class is if you want torque to go up, you need your speed to go down. If you want your speed to go up, you need torque to go down. You know, that's why in your vehicle, if you have a truck, right, you got four-wheel high and four-wheel low. All right, when you're in four low, you're going to have a lot of torque, a lot of pull. All right, you're getting out of the mud or you're pulling something extremely heavy, those sort of things. You're not going to get a lot of speed out of your vehicle in four low. All right, but you have a lot more torque. When you're in four high, right, you can go, you know, up to like 50, 55. You can push it faster than that. But still, you know, you're going to have more speed but a little less torque when you're in four high. Okay, and then when you're not in four-wheel drive at all, you're not going to have as much torque or pulling power or payload power because you have more speed that you want to do, right? You're just traveling down the road or things like that. So um, just think about that. You know, for these loads, though, power increases linearly, okay? But speed and torque are inverses of each other. So the best example for something like this, right, is a conveyor, right? We constantly put stuff on a conveyor, but we need to have constant torque so the conveyor's speed, right, adjusts. If you would come and put a really heavy load on a conveyor, we don't want the conveyor to stop and shut down. So we've got to make sure that the torque is constant on that, whether the load's really heavy or the load's really low, you know, and if we keep adding the load to it. There's loads that we have that are constant power loads, okay? Power has to stay at a constant as speed increases. Therefore, the torque has the torque, torque, sorry, the torque has to go down, okay? So constant power loads, okay? Power, right, is torque times speed. So constant is what we're going to have. We want constant power because we're getting torque times speed. And remember, torque and speed are inverses of one another. So that's where we're going to get a constant. And why do we want that? And what machines would we want that? A lathe or a milling type machine, right? You want constant power. So if you're, if you're milling, right, we've got a, a bit going through wood and it's running right down. We don't want, you know, the power to lag, you know, as it's going through the wood. Because if it sits in one spot too long, you know, it's going to burn as it's going around. So you want constant power, all right, so that it's giving you that constant, you know, turn to mill out the wood. Same with a lathe, right? That lathe... We want constant power because we don't want the second we start to kind of put the tool into the into the workpiece, all right, to actually slow it down or things like that. So we want to make sure that our power uh, is constant, so we'll be able to balance out speed and torque when we do this. Okay. And then lastly, uh, variable torque loads. We're going to use this with the uh, variable speed motors and things like that on some of the labs we do here. So this is where torque varies with speed, okay? Let's talk about a service factor now, okay? It's a multiplier. It's the overall operating parameter that a motor will periodically function in without being damaged. You know, what, what does this really mean? Well, this means that due to something that might be happening on the system, the motor might operate above what it is. So let's say we have a 10 horsepower motor, but something happens on the load there that strains it for a little bit. So that, that motor is going to step up and compensate. So it might actually run at like 12 horsepower for a little bit. And we can get away with that because of how we design it based on its service factor. So the motor can actually handle small increments operating above what it's supposed to be, OK? So if we have a Class B induction motor, it's going to be used in the piston compressor. All right, it's going to be operating for 20 hours a day. What's the proper service factor for this application? Okay, so you're going to look at the table on page 49. So you're going to have to have your book out for this one. So this is where you can go ahead and pause the video if you need to, open your book to page 49, all right, and uh, come back and pick up the uh, lecture here. And then we're going to talk about what is the power requirement by the driven equipment if the motor nameplate is 12 horsepower, okay? so. First, looking on page 49 in your book, we're going to look at the service factor there. Okay, it's important that we understand where we're lining things up. 
based on the class B induction motor. So you need to find the column that says class B induction motor, right, for the piston compressor there, and then how long it's going to be operated for. So we got to line up those columns. And when we do, or columns and rows. So when we do that, we see that the service factor is 1.4. Okay, so you should all be able to see that in the table there. So make sure you have your book out. Okay, and then uh, the second part, B, it says, what's the power required by the driven equipment if the motor nameplate is 12 horsepower? Okay, so we take 12 times the service factor, so 12 times 1.4, and that gives us 16.8 horsepower. So that means this motor can run at 16.8 horsepower without any significant damage being done to it, all right? So there might be something that's got to overcome because there's an extra load that's been on it. So it can always go above it. It's kind of like an elevator, guys. Uh, you know, everybody gets in an elevator and it's posted, you know, this elevator, the maximum weight is 2,000 pounds. Well, you know that it's more than 2,000 pounds because someone's going to try and push it past its limits. So there's a service factor that that elevator can actually hold more than 2,000 pounds, you know, even though it says it on there because they know that there's going to be a bunch of people that get in there and, hey, let's see if we can get it over 2,000 pounds and see what happens. So they design those sort of things in for, you know, people's stupidity or people that try to push things to the limit as well. All right. So let's talk about run out and overhung load. Run out, okay? If we just kind of look at the definition here, it's a measure of eccentricity or roundness of an object. It can be a radial or axial. So for us, you're going to look at run out when we start turning a, uh, you're not going to do while the motor's running, okay? But you're going to use the constant speed motor in uh, one of the labs, and you're going to turn it manually with your hand, but you're able to put the dial caliper, okay, on it, or I'm sorry, the dial indicator on it, all right? And you're going to see, you know, the roundness. Is there any, like, issues that it has as you turn it around? So that's its run out, okay? So hopefully... Uh, you know, er, there's no fluctuations in the dial indicator when you do that. Then the overhung load, that's a force that's imposed on a shaft perpendicular to its axis. Okay, so an overhung load has different impacts on a system here. All right, when you have like an arm that reaches out and the load is actually putting some sort of stress or strain on that shaft that's hanging over. Okay, so if we have, you know, a motor that's on a belt drive or some reason and the belt drive piece is vertical and the motor shaft itself is horizontal, that, okay, that belt drive is our overhung load, okay? So that can cause, you know, different damage to systems and things like that because then you run into, you know, shaft misalignment, the belt might be too tight or not tightened enough, right? And so we have a load location factor, okay, an LF. Okay, it's the location of the load from the supporting bearing, okay, causes the load moment to increase, okay? So it's where that load is and how far away, you know, the distance is for that perpendicular alignment. All right, so let's just do some review questions here. We are almost uh, done with the lecture, but this should end Chapter 3 for us. I'm uh, also going to do, uh, you know, another problem on the board that talks and uses efficiency in uh, kind of the gear drive, belt drive, chain drive, and gearbox all kind of thrown into one so we can see how they work together. All right, so what are the three classes of loads that we talked about? All right, constant torque, constant power, and variable torque. All right, so as the RPM of a shaft increases, the overhung loads on it decrease. Why? Okay, centrifugal force. Okay, that's an important one. We're spinning around in a circle. Okay, so remember the faster we spin, all right, we have a centrifugal force. You know, same reason, you know, if you were to spin yourself with your arms out and things like that, or you watch someone that is an ice skater in the Olympics, right, and they start spinning around really fast, they can use that centrifugal force, you know, to increase that. So, question three, which of the following components will typically have a higher overhung load on the drive shaft? Something like a gear drive, okay, a sprocket and chain drive, or a belt drive, okay? So we talked about this one. 
a belt drive, you know, just the previous slide when I was going through everything. Okay, what is the efficiency of a gear drive that receives a power of 5 horsepower and delivers a power of 4.7 horsepower? Okay, so you got to go back. Remember, efficiency, it's a percentage. Efficiency is always output over input times 100, okay? So it's going to be 4.7 divided by 5 times 100, so it's 94% efficient. All right, what's the mechanical advantage for each of the following pulley systems? Now, it's tough to see because these are all like block and tackle type scenarios here. So instead of, you know, everything looks like it has two, two sheaves on it, but uh, you got to count the strings, not the one with the arrow, okay? Not the one with the arrow. That's the force you would be pulling down with. So if you look at the gun and tackle, there's two strings. So we're really only using two sheaves there. If we look at the, the love for the watch tackle, all right? Notice there's three strings there, the double tackle, four strings, okay, so on and so forth. So if you guys count those strings, those are going to be our solutions, all right? So mechanical advantage for the first one is two, mechanical advantage for the second one is three, mechanical advantage for the last one is six, right? So whatever that weight is that we're lifting, we're going to divide it by whatever our mechanical advantage is. So if we're using the one on the far right, all right, and we're going to, you know, have our specific weight. Okay, we would take our weight, and it would take whatever we're trying to lift and divide it by six. So that's our mechanical advantage. All right, let's look. If we have the gin tackle there, all right, and say that's 100 pounds, right, that we're trying to lift. Well, the mechanical advantage is five. So I really only have to pull down with 20 pounds of force, right? 100 divided by five is 20. I pull down with 20 pounds of force to lift that 100-pound weight, okay? All right, so this wraps up Chapter 3. So we are done with Chapter 3. We're going to move on. Uh, there's some other, you know, calculations that I've got for you to do uh, when we do that, but this should be it. So you should be able to complete all of your homework, uh, make sure that we're doing the reading part uh, with this as well. And always feel free to email me with any questions or bring any questions to class uh, that you want to go over and discuss. Else, guys, have a great day. I'll see you in class.